Welcome to The Old Man and the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 203, Franz Wagner. Uh, we will get to Franz uh, in a little bit. A lot to cover across the NBA. I want to start uh, with some sad news, of course. Um, the NBA is a, a global basketball community, and we are just so saddened to learn of the passing of Golden State Warriors assistant coach Dejan Milojevic. Uh, uh, he was a, a player in Serbia, a coach in Serbia. He joined the Warriors staff in 2021 um, and, and had a medical emergency last night in Salt Lake City and, and ultimately just got confirmed that he passed. Um, so just our heartfelt condolences to everyone that Dejan has touched across the world in the basketball community. A quick moment of silence, Tommy. In other news, it's it's tough to go from that to basketball. Um, just an awful, an awful thing. Um, in other news, uh, the Indiana Pacers traded for Pascal Siakam from the Toronto Raptors. Uh, Bruce Brown, three first round picks, two this year. Um, my understanding is it's the Pacers' own pick, and then the worst of I think OKC, Houston, and the Jazz, whichever pick is worst, and their twenty twenty six their own pick as well. Um, Jordan Noir in that deal as well. New Orleans got involved to skate the luxury tax, sending Kyra Lewis and a couple of second round picks to Toronto. Um, Tommy, I, I have a lot of thoughts and all very positive. First of all, if I quickly on the Raptors, um, this felt like a long time coming. And the reports were that Siakam actually wanted to stay in Toronto and, and, and make this a long-term thing and help with whatever sort of rebuild, rejiggering of the roster was going on. Uh, them losing Fred Van Fleet last year in free agency, I think, had a, a real impact uh, on both the Siakam trade and the OG and Anobi trade because they lost Fred for nothing. Yep. And we've seen Fred and his impact on winning in Houston um, so I, I, I think Toronto made the, the right decision. This was a team that was going to be stuck in the middle and you get the picks. They've got young guys now in, in RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly, Scotty Barnes, of course, um, that you can sort of build and look for the future. I, I, I think about it this way with Siakam. He clearly makes the Indiana Pacers better, but I also think the Indiana Pacers are going to make him better. And that's talking about someone that has made two all-star games, two all-NBA teams, uh, made an all-star game last year, having another all-star-esque season yeah. this year. There was one particular point about his offensive game, and I think we can get into everything that I wanted to sort of bring up and ask you about first. He's shooting 50.9% uh, from three in his last 20 games, shooting 49% uh, on corner threes. But the way they play, we've talked a lot about the record-setting pace that offense has been on with Tyrese, you know, obviously when he's healthy, in there from a shooting standpoint, because Siakam started the year not shooting very well. From a shooting standpoint, do you think that this is going to open that up for him? And should we look to expect those numbers to continue? Maybe not that high, but some somewhere in that range of a 45 plus. I always say shooting begets shooting. And so when you have spacing and when you have multiple guys on the court that are at least threats from three, I think that allows for easier opportunities for everyone to shoot the basketball. Uh, Indiana Pacers right now, sixth and made threes, 10th and three point attempts, seventh and three point percentage, clearly one of the best sh shooting teams in the NBA. So Siakam is going to have space and he's going to have space to drive. He's going to have space to cut. He's been an excellent cutter all year. Uh, here's the thing. This is the really interesting thing. Shout out to Matthew Williams, who just sent this over to me about five minutes ago. Uh, the Raptors were first, are first in the NBA right now in fast break points. The Raptors are. Guess who's second? Indy. The Indiana Pacers. Second in the, the NBA. Raptors feel, does the Raptors <laughs> feel more surprising than in Indy it being does. there does Here's make the sense. Thing. Siakam, Siakam leads the NBA in field goal percentage in transition. Tyrese Halliburton leads the NBA in assists in transition. You talk about the spacing. The Pacers right now, everybody thinks of them as, oh, we're going to play at a fast pace and shoot threes. They lead the NBA in paint points. 
They lead the NBA in most made layups and dunks. And Pascal Siakam right now is on pace to set his career high for most layups and dunks made yeah. per game. This is, to me, a perfect fit offensively. This is the number one team, the team with the greatest offensive efficiency so far in NBA history. And to me, they're adding a guy that fits perfectly. Isn't it weird for a guy that's made multiple all NBA teams that you're like, he could actually get better? Yeah, and he's still, he's turning 30 in April. He's still in the prime of his career. Uh, you know, there, there was that Ringer article from earlier in the season about Tyrese Halliburton and him wanting to just build and recruit and make in, the Indiana Pacers a destination because of him. Yeah. Because of him. So I like this move for Indy, even though P Siakam, of course, there's no assurances he will resign. They gave up a lot of future draft capital for this. But if it goes well and Halliburton can convince this guy that, yeah, this is a perfect fit for you, which I think it should be, then I, I, I would love to see this be a long-term thing for the Indian Pacers. With, with the Pacers defensively, you know, it's been a, obviously not a, it's been a weakness, I would say, over the you know, course of the year, but they've been 16th in defensive efficiency over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they're 23 and 17 now. They're three and a half games out of the three seed. You've watched almost all of their games over the last couple of weeks. Have you seen an improvement there, or does this feel like uh, a little bit of a flash in the pan? And where do you think he's going to help them defensively? I think they have improved. To me, they have shown flashes uh, of sustained defensive effort. I think that's the biggest thing for me is like personnel wise, you know, Tyrese is not great, Buddy Heald is not great. Uh, TJ McConnell, as hard as he plays and as much as he fights, a lot of times he has a size disadvantage. Uh, Turner, of course, is, is going to protect the rim, but in space and then getting into rotations, they haven't been great. Yeah. And, and so what I've seen is a sustained level of effort from them. I think Siakam helps on the personnel standpoint, just because of his length and his size, um, does this make them a contender in the East? I guess that's the question. I don't think I'm there yet. This was a very fun basketball team that just got more fun. For sure. <laughs> if they weren't in your top five in league pass before well, this trade, they're certainly going to be after the trade. I was going to ask, you, you've played against him. you played against him for years, played against him in the playoffs. Yeah. You know, we've had him on the show. I think that everyone who sort of knows basketball knows how good he is and has been and everything like that. But he hasn't necessarily gotten as much love as didn't when Kawhi was there. Like he's been a guy that has flown under the radar, even making those all NBA teams. I'm like, like, what do you just from a pure entertainment standpoint, because he can do a lot of different things. I think besides him just playing with Tyrese, is there anything else you're like, Oh, this could unlock being in an offense like this. Cause those Toronto offenses were never, no one's been like the Pacers are, but they've never been an offense that has been like, yeah. consistently a top two, top three offense in the league. Um, I, I think this, I go back to the spacing, of course, you know, they're a team that plays fast. Uh, I think it fits his desire. You know, he's going to ISO. I, I like him when he's making quick decisions. He clearly can pass the ball. You think about the lack of shooting on the floor at times with him, with the Raptors, they're 26 and three pointers made in 23rd and three point percentage. And yet he was still having a career high in layups and dunks. Yeah. So like he's going to have more space to operate. Um, you know, I, I, I had somebody, I guys, I got to be honest with you. Oh, I got to be honest with you. I don't ever know what Jason and Richie and Nicole are going to post on social media. I literally don't know. Like Jason even asked me today. He's like, what do you want for the teaser for the Franz video? And I'm like, dude, it's your job. You do it as well as anyone in this industry. Just don't get, I don't, just don't care. Get fired. Just you don't know. get fired. All it is is don't put something in that's going to get you fired. But that's the it. other day, I, I didn't know this was going to be a thing, but the other day, like they posted my rant with Steven Nikias about like the non-traditional point guard and someone brought up Tyrese Halliburton as like being a traditional point guard. I'm like, I don't see that. I, I, we, if we, if you think Tyrese Halliburton is a traditional point guard, then we need to define what a traditional point guard is. Is it someone who gets assists? Because I got to be honest with you, a lot of guys get assists that aren't point guards. Nikola Jokic gets assists and he's not a point guard. Trey Young is not a traditional point guard and he gets a lot of assists. Assists are not the, the marker of a traditional point guard. I just want to say that. 
One thing about Tyrese that I fucking love is the way he just gets off the ball. That's not a traditional point guard yeah. that's orchestrating every single fucking play. Tyrese Halliburton is going to get an outlet pass and he's going to look up the floor. And if you're open, he's going to kick it ahead. Getting it. Yeah. And he doesn't worry about getting it back and then manipulating things in the half court. He just plays, right? He's going to feed Siakam in transition after me- misses, after makes. This is how the Pacers play. All of a sudden, Siakam's got a head of steam with shooting around him. Come on, man. This yeah. He's going to be really, really good for Indiana. Do you think the... the you, met, you mentioned the OG trade as well. The timing of this... I mean, obviously, we're not in these in these rooms. We don't know for sure on anything. But the, the the OG trade happening on December 30th or December 29th or whatever it is, this trade happening now, is this more of a case of Toronto being like, we're going to make sure that we get this right before bringing it up to the deadline? Or a team like Indy being like, we actually think we can make a run at this. Let's see if we can, we, let's see if we can line this up now. I know Tyrese isn't back yet, but yeah. by the time he gets back, you know, past COVID a couple of weeks of sort of acclimating to the new system and everything like that and, and really setting themselves up for like what could be a sustained playoff push. On the Pacers point, every team is always trying to get better. Every team that's in the win now mode, I should say, is always trying to get better. Like, so the Boston Celtics right now, Brad Stevens is trying to figure out how to add a rotation piece for the playoffs. Yeah. Like they've got the trade except like every team that is in win now mode is looking to add. Yeah. There's not a GM out there that is like, I'm completely satisfied with that roster. I think in the Pacers case, I, I think they're clearly a fun team that can win ball games, that can outscore you. And whether they're a piece away or two pieces away prior to this trade, they felt like this is an opportunity to improve the roster and improve the team. Whether that vaults them into, into Eastern Conference contention, I, you know, and they whether they think that or not, that's up to them. I, yeah. I, I, I'm not there yet. As it relates to the Raptors, I go back to last year again, where they're just in trade rumors. They end up hanging on to these guys. They they lose in the play in in the play in um, tournament. They don't make the playoffs. They're coming off a season where they lose to Philly in the first round. I, I think the the writing's on the wall. And so you you if you're Masai, if you're Bobby Webster, you're looking at return. What is a palpable return? Because if you wait and wait and wait again, maybe. Maybe a palpable return doesn't happen again. Yeah. Or and, maybe Indy goes and gets someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're holding the bag again. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. Last thing before we get to Franz, uh, I do want to do our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. And I want to talk about the Denver Nuggets and the Philadelphia 76ers game. The matchup, using quotes here, the matchup between Nikola Jokic and Joel Embiid. And the reason I, of course, put in uh, the quotes here is because they didn't really guard each other a lot, right? They were cross-matched the whole game. Uh, I thought both teams in the first half were so fucking confused by the cross-matches. One of the worst defensive halves I've seen from any team all season. Like, And these are two of the best teams in the league. Bad defense. Bad, bad defense. So many, uh, Denver specifically, uh, some really questionable schemes to start the game, like Jokic in a drop, but returning to Embiid and letting Maxi turn the corner every single time. They're forcing a middle on every pick and roll. They eventually made the adjustment and iced it or downed it down to towards the baseline. In the second half, Maxi would throw back to Embiid. You get his elbow iso, right? He's still in his sweet spot. I think what's interesting as I'm watching this game is like, so Jokic has the cross match uh, with Tobias Harris to start the game and, and be just kind of a, a rover off of Aaron Gordon. And it took like three possessions and Jokic figured it out, right? It's, it's, these guys are too good. Yeah. <laughs> these guys are too good. I, I would have liked to have seen, and maybe we'll see it next Saturday, the game I'm calling. I would have liked to see them match up more. Uh, I think uh, Jokic was like one for five against Joel Embiid last night or something like that. And Embiid was five for seven against Jokic. Um, I, I am I am at the point now with Joel Embiid where I'm just going to say it. Say it. He's fucking unstoppable. <laughs> He's unstoppable. He's too good of a shooter. <laughs> like he's obviously got footwork. He drives. He gets the free throw line. He's too good of a shooter. What's crazy? I heard this before the Rockets game. So uh, this was 
Rockets game was what Monday? Yeah, he played. I heard this on Sunday. He hadn't even when he was out. He barely picked up a ball. From people around him, like he barely picked up a ball. He just is that good. He's yeah. that gifted. He just literally just walks on the court and dominates the defending champions and another team, which is one of the best defenses in the league, one of the best teams in the Western Conference. I had one funny stat. I don't know if you saw this last night, which is just weird that I wanted to bring up, which doesn't really mean anything. But Basketball Reference said. Six time in NBA history, both teams have scored seventy eight plus points in the first half. Every one of them has been Nuggets and Sixers. That is the which is weirdest bizarre. thing. <laughs> <Which> is <just laughs> like, that is the weirdest thing. And I guarantee you, some of those games, or I would venture to say, a f- at least a few of those games were in the eighties with those Nuggets teams yeah. that averaged one hundred and forty points a game or whatever it was. Um, that is a bizarre stat. I want to go through these Embiid shooting stats because I'm fascinated by it. Second in the league in mid range ISO possessions uh, and he's second in the league in points per direct chance in ISO possessions. He leads the league in ISO shots in the mid range. Uh, He's fourth overall in mid range jumpers attempted. And he's one of three guys right now in the league to shoot uh, 50% or better from mid range. He's third. He's at 52%. uh, Shea's at 57. Chris Middleton actually is at 58 having a nice season. Joel Embiid has taken 106 one dribble pull-ups I would venture to say 105 of those have been uh, with his left hand in the mid range. 52.8% leads the league has taken 146, two dribble pull-ups in the mid range, 52.7%. That's second in the league. You watch the tape. Now you watch how these teams are guarding him. There's such an intention to keep their hands back, to keep their hands out of the cookie jar. Aaron Gordon last night in the first half, he, he had his hand out there. Joel, he times it perfectly. He's too smart. Yeah. And he's too skilled. He still makes the shot. He got his hands up. Gordon got a piece of it. Still made the shot. Joel wanted a foul. Late in the fourth quarter, he gets into his jab game. He comes all the way up, essentially from the ground. Gordon puts his hand out. Foul. Still made the shot. It's unguardable. You watch Shingoon the other night. He Joel's got the ball in his left hand. And Shingoon is literally, like, intentionally, hands back. I'm not fouling this motherfucker. I'm not putting my hand in the cookie jar. He's too smart. He times it so perfectly when you do it, and he still makes the shot. Can you describe, you have you played with Joel for two years. You're very friendly yeah. with him. You know intimately how he, but like, how much better is he now even than then? And then, I remember then you even said, like, this guy is, you said if he wants to be, this guy's the best player in the world. You said that the second you started playing with him. So it was like, even then there was a possibility of this, but this wasn't the case in those two years. I remember... In my free agency meeting with the Philadelphia 76ers, I show up uh, in Camden, New Jersey at the practice facility, drove down from New York that night. Billy Lang came over, picked me up. We show up right after midnight, go into the facility. Joel is there. I've told this story a million times. We're, I got a sport coat on. We're like walking through two man action on the left side of the court. Right. And we're back in, uh, we're back in Brian Colangelo's office and Brett's in there, the owners, everybody, Joel's in there. And Brett Brown said, uh, you know, I was in San, San Antonio a long time and I played with one of the greatest players ever. Or, I, you know, I coached one of the greatest players ever and we won a lot. And that was Tim Duncan. And he said, this motherfucker is Tim Duncan. <laughs> I said after my first year, I was like, that's the best guy I've ever played with. Joel Embiid is the best player I've ever played with. You're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Joel Embiid is the best player. And I, I said that after, like, essentially his second year of playing in the yeah. NBA coming from you. It means a lot. And coming from Brown about Duncan means a lot. So, okay. So the, on to the unstoppable question, here to get to the odds tie game, one eleven, one eleven. Joel comes in, scores 11, the next 50 points, 10 straight, 12, two run games over when they play again, even for other teams, if it's 111, 111 and with three minutes up in the fourth quarter and you know, he's there. What do you do? <laughs> like what's the th- like the, you like you know this is, is coming if he's healthy is, what do you they, do they, they started doing this a lot more with doc rivers uh they just give him the ball at the elbow you it's really hard to double from that position on the floor and the thing that joel has really grown as and it's not just this year i know that the numbers are up he has grown over the last few seasons as a passer a more willing passer i mean there are times last night you're watching and he's Got the ball in his hands. They know he knows they're going to double, and he just waits and waits. Okay, swing it, Maxi three. Swing it, open Harris three. Whatever it is, 
that's what makes him unguardable now is that he he thinks the game as well as anyone. Yeah. He thinks the game as well as anyone. I got one last stat. Uh, so only six players have averaged 35 points in a season in the NBA. James Harden in 2018, 2019, Kobe in 05, 06. MJ did it twice, 86, 87, 87, 88. Uh, Rick Barry in 66, 67, Elgin Baylor in 61, 62, and Wilt did it for the first five years of his career. If you go by like per 75, per 100, obviously we don't have numbers for that on basketball reference uh, back in the 60s. I don't, we don't have those numbers till 73, 74. But uh, Embiid in terms of per possession, uh, number one, uh, only one player ever has averaged 35, 10, and 5 for an NBA season. That was Wilt in 63, 64. And here's what I want to point out with how crazy Joel Embiid's production is this season. That season, Wilt averaged 46 minutes per game. Joel is averaging 34 minutes a game. We don't have possession numbers, but we can use some logic and deduce that there were may, way more possessions back then. In 63-64, the average team in the NBA took 99 field goal attempts and 35 free throws. 99 field goal attempts and 35 free throws. This year, teams on average shoot 89 field goal attempts and 23 free throws. The production and efficiency that Joel is having right yeah, now is nuts. Is all time. It's all time. Yeah. It's all time. And one more shout out, real quick. Tobias Harris. Yeah, I was gonna say my guy. Plus 13. My guy. Just balling out this year. The perfect third option. I'll say it. I'll keep saying this through the deadline. They don't need another star. They don't need another star. Maxie's a star. Joel is a star. Tobias is a do great need, third option. Do they need do they need a a defensive wing. Give me Caruso. That's what it is. Just someone who plays D. <laughs> someone who plays D. Like you know, because you know what you have in Boston. Yeah. So it's like that's what you have to. Here's something else. here's here's something crazy. So I want to go through this real quick. Opening odds for a championship. Both these teams championship aspirations. Denver opened the season at plus six hundred. Philly at plus eleven hundred. Right now, the Nuggets at plus four fifty, and the Seventy Sixers at plus eleven hundred. I like that bid on the 76ers. And the other crazy thing is opening MVP odds, Joel Embiid plus 600, Jokic at plus 475 on DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, Nikola Jokic, after last night at plus 250 and Joel at plus 330, they got to be factoring in the games, games played. Because the he, new 65 he misses, game he, limit. He misses eight yeah. more. Is that what it is? Something like yeah. that. It's wild. Were you thinking last night, no disrespect to our friends in Boston, no disrespect to Damon Giannis. Were you thinking last night this would be a fun finals matchup I, that was a thought by the third quarter you're I, like i could get talked into like four or five really awesome and perfect for the league and perfect for fans and perfect for the basketball sickos i could get talked into four or five matchups that would be awesome yeah i guess it's it's a little bit of like recency bias it's like you watch one of yeah. those games you're like oh that's that's one and then, of them and then boston plays them yeah. and you're like it's the same thing i just you know it i'll put some bias in there fuck it i root for my friends yeah <laughs> i do I don't analyze them any differently. I don't, but I root for them. I, I like when Drew and Chris were playing back in 21. Now I just, you know, it was finished my last season. I was like torn. Yeah, I was, was torn. Tough. I was I like, that. who do I want to win the yeah, final? Someone's going to be happy and someone's going to. The Vibe in Philly, you know, we're going to do more stuff with some of those guys later on. Like the Vibe in Philly is really good. It is really it's good. It's really good. They just, really it's good. like they've, they've figured it out. The NBA season is in full swing. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app with code JJ. New customers can bet just 5 bucks on the NBA and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash basketball for eligibility and deposit restriction terms and responsible gaming resources.
This has been uh, our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. Let's get to Franz Wagner. I, I just want to say this, Tommy. Uh, Franz came over the other night. Um, they were here to play the New York Knicks the next day. And I like love him as a player. He's one of the rising stars in the NBA. Obviously, had has had uh, some international success as well with Germany uh, winning the World Cup this year. He had 22 against the United States in the semifinals of the World Cup. I was so impressed. In some ways, I was blown away by this guy's mindset and the way he's wired. And there were some questions that I asked and that you asked his answers. I'm not going to say they surprised me, but I was a little taken aback yeah. by how he was wired. The thing about why he wanted to go to college you said versus it. going straight to you the NBA after, from Europe, you said I, I was just like, oh you were, shit. You were like, I'm watching, you told Kylie and, and Richie and Jason and I, you were like, I'm watching these games that have nothing to do with the magic and I'm thinking about Franz right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People can leave an impact on you. What do you want me to say? Cool. What do you want me to say? Let, cool. Let's get to our interview with Orlando Magic star, Franz Wagner. I've never been to Berlin. Tommy, I, mean, I don't know if you have. I have been once. I've heard it's lovely. I want to know about Berlin. Tell me about Berlin. If you love New York City, you will love Berlin as well. It's, uh, it's just a little smaller, I'd say, than New York City, but... I love coming to New York because it reminds me a lot of back home. Really? Yeah. No, it's very similar. I was thinking about just, the, you know, we always talk about the influx of European players, international players, not just European players. And everybody makes a big deal of Jokic and his just like, I just want to go home. I just yeah, want to be yeah. home. You know what I mean? Uh, is that common? Like, do you feel that? During the season, are there times, and I don't know where you live in the office. I don't know where you train. I'm just, right. are there times you're like, man, I just, I wish I was back in Germany. <laughs> I mean, I definitely miss home at times. Um, I think as every, every person does a little bit, I still got my friends there. My family still lives there. And there isn't really, aside from New York, maybe a little bit, but it's not really comparable to just American life. So um, I miss that part sometimes a little bit, but I wouldn't say that during the season that I'm like, oh, I'm. You know, just waiting for the season to, to be over. I, I really enjoy my time in Orlando. And I kind of enjoy, too, that's a lot different from back home and from, you know, how I grew up. Yeah, Central Florida is not like New York. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's JJ knows, he knows yeah. both pretty well, I would say. You got, this yeah, is, these seven are two, years there. These are two seven locations you're, you're, you, are, you do have expert knowledge. What was it like for you and Mo, uh, basketball-wise, growing up? Yeah, it was, we, uh, we grew up like five, ten minutes from Alba Berlin's gym, practice facility, um, which Alba is like the biggest club in Germany, one of the biggest ones in uh, in Europe. They're playing EuroLeague now for a couple of years. So we were extremely fortunate to be able to start at a at a club like that. From I started playing basketball when I was seven, more a little later than that. But um, yeah, we just had, we were just really lucky with the resources that we had from a young age and the coaches that were, um, you know, helped us grow at, as players and, and people too. And yeah, you like as you guys, I'm sure know you. You don't play for your high school or your school. You play for a club team, um, and then if you're a good player, they kind of call you up to the professional team. You're you're allowed to practice with them, and then maybe get some some game minutes as well. And yeah, you you started a little earlier playing basketball against grown grown men. I would say I think that's I'm fascinated by this because in in America, right? You. I was telling you, I just got done, literally just got home about yeah. five minutes before you got here. Um, it's coaching Knox on like a travel team. Yeah. And then he'll play, you know, junior high school for school, keep playing on a travel team. But then he'll play high school. And like some kids obviously elect to go play at a prep school like Oak Hill or something like that or Montverde. How does the process work? Like when you're <laughs> growing up in Germany and – you're you like know you're good yeah obviously you've got to like then go find somewhere to play someone has to identify like how does how did it all work out that you got selected by this professional club to be able to train there and eventually practice with the a squad yeah i mean the infrastructure is uh or the system itself is different you um don't play for your local school or anything like that you practice in the club um your local club most of the times as you get older and better there's just a few select clubs that it really makes sense as a young player to play for. And like I said earlier, I was fortunate. I started off with one of those clubs from a young age. So I didn't have to 
move places or go work out an hour from my home. Um, like a lot of other players have to do when they grow up, they leave home when they're 14, 15, you know, to practice with a better club, with a bigger club that has more resources and better coaches and plays in higher leagues. And so I was really fortunate with that in Berlin that I, that I had that club like right up the street from, from us basically. And after that, I mean, I started playing when I was seven. You just kind of move up the like age ranks, um, I would say. You're a good player. You're playing the first team. There's enough. Like there's a um, if you're if you're in the first team and in, in kind of your age group, you uh, start playing national nationally around like 12, 14 um, in Germany. And then there's like tournaments throughout the year where, like, if you're on a on a bigger club, you get to play against some uh, bigger European clubs and their younger teams. And um, yeah, once I once I got around like 14, 15, 16. I didn't just practice with the under-16 team anymore. I practiced with the under-19 team. And then, um, you know, they saw potential in me, so they brought me up to the to the professional club. I had my first practice there when I was 16. And, um, I mean, yeah, it's it's a bunch of 25 to 30-year-olds that went to college. Most of them um, are Americans or half of the team. Uh, most times is uh, from America or from other European countries. And, yeah, just go to practice with them, learn from them. Um, if you're lucky, you get to play in some games. Um, and I was really lucky. I uh, finished high school when I was 16. So I had a whole gap year basically after I finished high school and before I had to make the decision if I want to go to college. And so that year gave me the opportunity to just go practice with the professional team while all my other players in my age group, they were still going to high school. And I was able to go to practices at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., with the professional team, just travel with the professional were, team the whole year. Were you getting paid to do this th no. that, that year? No, I wasn't. So how did? So how? Did, I I was curious about this too. So how does this work? You're playing and practicing with the professional team. You're not getting paid, and that's a decision you've made because you wanted you'd rather go to college. So I, was, I didn't know at the time that I was for sure but going you to college. To keep that option open, right? So they offered me a contract. Not a great contract. Um, wouldn't make sense in my position to sign it unless people have money problems. Some people might sign it, but um, I was trying to keep that option open. And um, yeah, obviously the the professional team they invest a lot of money, time, resources in these in in a good young player. So they want to make sure that you stay with the club at some point. So they get some type of stuff in return. Um, if it's an NBA buyout or something like that. Um, so obviously they're, they're trying to keep their young players with the program. The NBA season is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official partner of the NBA. Right now, new customers bet 5 bucks and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Friday night, the Denver Nuggets visiting the Boston Celtics in what could be a potential finals preview. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app with code JJ. New customers can bet just five bucks on the NBA and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash basketball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Did you feel like at a younger age the, the players were more unselfish there? I know I know people talk about this with FIBA and they talk about this with the older teams, but do you feel like it was taught to you at young? Oh yeah, well, I didn't play pick and roll until I was like fifteen, maybe. No, like shit, it's crazy. It's all we run. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I all. think I think it's just that just shows you we we play completely different in practice we just grow up playing different it was all give and go cut pass and move like we didn't really have no real like we had structure and principles and stuff like that but no like system or like too high or five like 
whatever. Like we didn't have none of that growing up. Until just I, concepts. Just concepts. Reading the game, reading space, um, cutting, passing. Like I remember when I grow up, we we had this game in practice. If you get as a team ten passes in a row, you get a point. It wasn't even about scoring. It was just can you move, pass, cut um, better than the other team can basically defend you. I'm just I'm sorry. Um, and I was, I was, I think that's that just shows you. I think it's just how you grow up um, playing basketball, and I think you can tell when you watch European players play a little bit. I was on one team. I'm not going to say which team. And the coach in practice. This is the NBA, by the way. The coach in practice would be like, "All right, we're going to stay in the half court, and you, you're going to try to score, but you can't dribble." <laughs> And no one knew what to fucking do. Right, right. <laughs> like, it was like, yeah, it was wild. Now I like moving off the ball, so I was like, all right, I, I, yeah, you're I, probably I feel really like good. I can, at it, yeah, I can get my shot off here. I don't yeah. need to dribble. I didn't really like to dribble anyway, so it was like it was it was wild. The other thing that I have uh, ranted a little bit about um, is the FIBA rules around the gather step, which mirror the NBA rules and they are supposed to, they don't always get called, but they are supposed to get called at the youth AAU high school level in the United States. Right. When do they start teaching you guys all of the footwork? Cause that's the, I don't watch a ton of college basketball and your rookie year was the first year I was retired. And that was like the first thing that struck me when I watched you play was like, Oh, got insanely good footwork clearly that's not something that like you just picked up at michigan like that it was built into your individual training and how early did that start i mean i remember like pivot stuff and just basic footwork um pretty much when i started playing basketball like seven eight years old um it's not like oh how many like between the leg dribblings can you do in a row it's can you just like be balanced with the basketball, like just basic shooting, um, cutting, just un just understanding the game. Sometimes we play soccer, you know, when I was seven, eight years old, like so it was fun was more part of practice than any of the getting in your back stuff, I would say. Um, but yeah, just I think those type of those type of like reading and reacting drills, um, and the footwork stuff, I, I'm like the most basic stuff. We we did that a bunch growing up. Did you watch any particular guys growing up that you sort of modeled anything after? I mean, this is I, I was I was a big. This is not necessarily like gonna fit with uh, all everything that we just said, but obviously a uh, Dirk um, is like I gotta mention him. He's a huge influence for every every young European basketball player. Um, and then I was I uh, I remember watching a Dwayne Wade documentary when I was really young. Um, <laughs> yeah, I said I mean no, no, the NBA the NBA no. is uh, is cool like it's sexy to watch right so like, all the cool dunks and all of that. Um, so I, I was a I was a Dwayne Wade fan. Yeah, that, that's like one of the things I remember. Dwayne Wade low key had elite footwork though. No, he did. Yeah, no. like crazy good footwork, crazy spin moves. I'm just saying I didn't Step necessarily throughs. play like Dwayne Wade. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I would say there is an element of your game that you play like D Wade. That's true. There's an element there. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that the everybody takes a different route to get to this place, right? In terms of being prepared, was there something that you felt when you got to the league that like really prepared you? Maybe it was just getting to practice against professionals at such a young age, but seems like getting to play professionally essentially for two years with a EuroLeague team and then spending time in the United States, two years in Michigan, seems like you, you checked all the boxes a little bit, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I felt, I felt prepared. Um, I think the decision to, for going to college wasn't as much about Basketball in the sense of like learning skills or anything like that it was more a mentality thing. I think American players, there's a little bit more of that cutthroat um, in, Amer in American culture, the competitiveness, all of that is a little bit more celebrated, I would say, than back at home. I, I felt for me to like make the next step as a player, I needed uh, a lot of responsibility, um, pressure too, and playing in pressure situations. 
And um, I needed to like really, uh, really let that let that part of me come out. The competitive, like I can, I'm gonna kill you tonight on the court. Like the letting ass, that come the out. Asshole in you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I I felt like I had that, and it came out at times. I would say back home, but it's just not as you're not getting challenged like that as you are maybe in a in a college setting. Did it did it come out in that semifinal game against the U.S.? Did that asshole come out? I would say so a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I was I was talking a little bit. You know, having you, having you fun talking with to Mikel. <laughs> um, I remember. Yeah, we were we were going back and forth a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I was. I think you were at the game too. The magic. The magic game. game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man. And Mikel had twenty six in the first yeah, half. He was, he was and yapping. I was just was like, yapping. man, there's. Mikel was talking shit that game. Oh man, he and was. I, and it was at you. It, it was I mean and he I was came like, at me. This seems this seems personal. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean, look, I'm all here for competition. He he got us that game. And um yeah, I think I think that's just part of the game and I, I enjoy that part of the game, honestly. Obviously that that game was not super enjoyable, but if it was personal, I, I mean he's the only <laughs> one that can that can speak to that. But um I'll take that as a compliment, I would say. Yeah. This aspect of uh the Read and react, um, practicing without dribbling, um, all of the stuff that gets taught in international countries versus how kids, I think, grow up playing in, in, in 90% of youth programs in the United States. It seems like there's a big adjustment when U.S. players go and play in FIBA. Mm -hmm. Offensively, defensively. Is there anything specific do you that you because you've lived now in both, obviously. Is there anything specifically that you think is the hardest part for an American player going to play in a World Cup or an Olympics against a really good international team? I mean, I think you can you could see it a little bit. I think if you look at you know that semifinal game, you look at the two teams on paper, there's no question who should win, right? Well, I think you, you can see like in like, there's some situations where, like, somebody on the German team, if it's me, if it's Dennis, another player, there's some tough buckets being made. But the the gist of why we won is simple basketball, getting a switch. How do you duck in, beating the post, playing out of that, cutting off the ball? Like it's it's not it's not the crazy schemes. It's not crazy individual play. Um, you need some of that too in FIBA. Um, especially at the end of games, but I think that's the biggest difference, with, with, like in terms of how we played. And I mean, it's it's like anything else. The the American players, the NBA players, aren't necessarily super used to that style of play, so it's hard for them to to adjust in those moments. One thing I observed, and this wasn't just uh, the German team. I think there's a number of teams uh, that did this well in the World Cup. But you know, let's say you have an ATO in the NBA. Um, by the way, I'm not complaining about any of this. I'm just pointing out some things I've observed that are different. That's all. Let's say there's an ATO in the NBA after timeout play. You might uh, try to get a matchup, right? All right, we're going to run uh, a step up on the right side, and we're going to get so-and-so to switch on Tatum. Or we might say, like, all right, we're going to have Tatum at the top, and D. White's going to bring his man up and go screen Tatum to his right hand. Let's see what happens, yeah. right? The scripted plays for these fucking teams in FIBA. It's like five different actions to get to one last thing that that's what you're actually looking for. That, to me, was the craziest thing to watch. And again, not a knock on Steve Kerr. I'm just pointing this out. You watched our ATOs or our set pieces, and it was like two very different things. It was like watching two different sports at times. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the coaching piece... Um, I think it's just a very different approach to how to coach and yeah, how to just approach the game, I would say. Um, I will say that that's something that like I had to like, or like I re-noticed, I would say, because I grew up playing like that. Then I went to college, we played different. In the NBA, we played different. Um, and when I came back from our first year for a national team, I was like, yo, this is nice. This is a lot of fun to play like this because... <laughs> It, it makes, like, if you can execute those plays, you don't need to make step back threes and make tough shots all game. Like I said, I, I think you do need that at the end of the game sometimes, but um, the 
that part of the of thinking the game and um yeah, how coaches can set up players and make them look really, really good. I think that part is really fun of the FIBA game. I'm going to ask you a question, and this is just a question. This is not meant to offend anyone, okay? Do you think that some of the reason we don't have that in our game is maybe, I think naturally in, in the U.S. there's like that, more of like an individual mentality, and I think we praise like scores, we praise tough bucket getters. And truthfully, some of these motherfuckers are so good <laughs> that you don't need to run exactly. four misdirections exactly. to create a good shot on offense. And I mean, even, even with this you know, USA basketball team, they, they practiced for two weeks. They went and played a few exhibition games. Obviously, it didn't work out for us. But like, we were still in games right? playing that way. It wasn't like we were getting blown out by 50. You know, so I think I think some of it is just like the overall talent. This is not I'm saying overall, top to bottom. You said the on paper, right? One through twelve, probably more talented, and so there's there's not that like desire, like need to like, oh, we got to play this way. Now it bit us in the ass for sure. <laughs> well, I want to point one thing. Oh yeah, and this might be an unpopular opinion, but this is not the first tournament where this has happened. I agree. Like, even if Team USA won in past years, that was still very apparent. Even the legendary Kobe Bryant 2008 team, you can look back. I don't know what it was, but they, they didn't win the final by 20 points. They won by, like, six or eight um, against Spain, who started Ricky Rubio, who's 17. Um, I mean, that, that Spanish team is probably the epitome of what we just talked about, yeah. like, in terms of how European uh, teams... Uh, grow up playing and so I, I'm not I'm not like the U.S. players individually like there's there's no argument who's the most talented country in uh, in basketball yeah yeah I, I wasn't I, I by the way I, I think the gap for probably most every guy on your team and an NBA roster spot if they so desired is like this or this yeah. like it's th that part of it is I totally, I, I, I wasn't trying to knock the talent. I actually promised myself this was going to be a rant-free pod, podcast. And it's go. going to be. But right. I will know it's going to be. It but I do want to point out, that was the one thing that really got me heated. The reaction at home here was like, oh, we're supposed to be winning. We're supposed to be winning. And I'm like, no, 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 guys. Like, since like 96, it's always been hard. Right. Like, the, the, these, these teams, you guys have, like caught up to us. You've caught up to us and you're better than us in some ways. Isn't that just, the truth? Isn't that kind of just like people that don't know basketball history though? I mean, we talk about this, but it's just like, this is like to your point, this is not new. The, the, the question I had for you about your particular team and also what we're talking about is the connectivity with you, with this particular roster and how yeah. long you guys have, I mean, so how long with most of these guys, Mo aside, did you play together with them for? Well, I didn't, I only played with one guy, like, when I was younger that was on that team. Um, and this was only the second time that I was on the uh, men's national, like, the senior the senior national team. But the, the core of those guys, they've been playing together probably five, six years, I would say. Yeah, maybe maybe even longer. Dennis is playing, has been playing for 20, since 2013, something like that, yeah. Because this would be, I mean, not, not that you want to fix USA basketball, but it feels like a massive problem with USA basketball is it's different players every time. Yeah, I mean, the the whole approach to that, I think, is different. I'm not, oh yeah, like, yeah, it's it's yeah. A, just a different thing. Like, when, when we play European championships, like, it's just it's just a pride thing to be able to represent the country. Um, and it's every year like that. Like, I'm already excited to go play with them again because it's just a... It's just a different vibe. It's it's none of the playing for money, playing for stats. It's very like it. F it just feels like old classmates coming together for a summer and we're having a good time. That's what did it, what did it mean for you for your team to win that gold medal? Um, I can't even put it into words. Like I don't think people from here understand like how big um, the gold medal was for for not just the players that played, but for the whole German basketball community. Like. When when I grew up, like it's not a thing to think about that we might win one of those tournaments. Like it's just not. You don't even think about it. It's like oh, it's cool to like get a medal, um, or it's cool to play for a medal. But 
um, you you don't grow up thinking that you might you might win the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about this year's Magic team. A little bit of a rough stretch. Yeah. For for you guys, you've been out. Um, but overall, I think you guys have to be really happy with just how the season has gone, being in, in playoff contention, top five defense in the league, all of those things. I played for Jamal Mosley. Oh, uh, really? When he was with Dallas, my last oh, right. two yeah. and a half months of my career, yeah. I played in eight games. I mean, I was, no, no, I probably yeah, played eight true. minutes in eight games too. <laughs> I was a little banged up, but uh, I loved, loved Mose and got to see him uh, coach, actually be a head coach for, for one of the games, one of the first games. I wasn't back from injury yet, but one of the first games. I can't remember the reason Rick Carlisle couldn't coach that night, but there was a, there was a reason. Maybe he was sick or something, and yeah. Moe's coached. Really impressed by him. Um, what has he sort of done for you guys in terms of building this culture over the last uh, two, three seasons now? Yeah. I mean, Moses, uh, I would say the ultimate player's coach. Um, he, when he comes into a room, he's uh, – yeah, he just gets attention, creates attention in the whole room, um, and brings people together. I think that's his that's his biggest thing. He, you can feel when you play for him. He really cares for you as a player, and that's uh, I think super special in in like a professional setting like this, where players are in and out, teams change every year. Um, he really gives gives you that feeling that he cares for you, and I think he sets the tone uh, for a group. Um, the way we play, I think. Kind of shows the type of person he is. We want to play together. We want to play super tough. He's defensive mind. I think we we try to implement all of those things um, on the court. And um, I would say the biggest thing this year was a little a little change in our mentality that we really believe that we're a good team. And um, I think that started a little bit last year, but it's work. I think to commit to that every day in practice. Um, yeah, and it's I think it starts everything starts with most. Why do you think the, your one two punch with you and Paolo? It's so hard for, for teams to sort of match up with. I think just Paolo is uh, super versatile, and um, there's always a mismatch out there when he's out there on the court. And I think he's also a, a super smart player. And I think we got co- good chemistry. Um, I think we like playing for each other, playing for the team. And um, obviously, ta- Paolo is super talented, so uh, creates a lot of advantages for, for the rest of the guys out there. It's interesting because I think... In today's NBA, outside of like a couple anomalies, uh, I'll throw Steph in there and I'll throw Jokic and Embiid and Giannis in there. I think I'll throw Shea too, for sure. Because I think he's at that level where he could be the number one guy on a winning team. I think it's like the big ball handling wing, that prototype of like the creator, the scorer, facilitator, all of that stuff. Um, Did you envision for yourself when you were coming into the league that you would first have this much success early on, but did you understand that sort of prototype? Cause you have worked your way. And so has Paula, like you guys have two of them essentially. Yeah. Did you understand that coming into the league? And no. what are the, what like, what are those responsibilities night to night? No, I mean, my expectations coming in where, um, I, I was just trying to get on the court, honestly, trying to maximize my time on the court. Um, I was a really versatile player in college, um, but definitely didn't handle as much uh, as I do now. So uh, I'm, I was really fortunate that um, you know, the first year we were kind of struggling as a team, figuring things out. And I got a lot of on-ball reps and was kind of able to, you know, learn on the fly a little bit and probably get a little bit too much responsibility and make some mistakes as well. And that was that was I think just golden for my development that I was able to do that so early. And um, yeah, I think from now it's I just I just try to you know be be the best player I, I can be. Um, I think there's a there is a lot of responsibility on the on the both of us, and coaches talk to has has made that really clear. I think to everybody on the team, and for me, I just want to pay that back with making the right decision out there every time. Um, I think I, I do a great job of getting in the paint, and um, I think this year I, I've been getting better at making others around me better and being a playmaker and not just trying to score every time. And I think that's that's the key to you know, play chess out there a little bit. That's what Mo's always says. They, they're going to load up and just make the right play every time. Your, your rookie year, you had a stretch from November to January. You had 23 straight double-figured uh, games with the 38-piece against the Bucks in the middle of that. 
were you surprised at all in in the middle of that stretch how easy it was for you to score compared, especially compared to even where you were in college as a scorer I mean I wouldn't say it was easy to score but it's, it was definitely like a point in the season where where I kind of noticed there's a huge difference just in terms of how the game is just flowing compared to college and I think just in general I noticed a little bit that the, the NBA game fits me a little bit better than college it, it's a lot more space it's not as physical I would say in the paint uh, especially where I'm uh, you know, I'm not the strongest guy so I think I was a I was at a little bit at a disadvantage there in college and space for for a tall guy like me that, that can move and um, place from the perimeter I think it's uh, yeah helps me a lot uh, Luca once said on the podcast that it's way easier to score 30 in the NBA than it is to score 30 uh, in FIBA or in, in you know, EuroLeague. And I think in some ways it's probably easier to score 30 in the NBA than it is. Oh, yeah. To, For sure. To college. Than is college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. College, the pace college, is so different. The pace is yeah. so different. Longer shot clock. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of zone. I, I think the the natural conclusion of that is just like well the nba players must not play defense right. right i just want to point out like in college especially there's 10 players on the floor the really really good teams might have like two or three pros and if you're playing another good team they might have like two or three nba guys yeah so there's like four guys that aren't nba guys on the floor and you can load up you can be yeah. in this to paint 3 seconds like i think I think it's just way tougher to score in college, FIBA, whatever, based on that. You, I think the thing you said is the most important thing, and that's just space. Yeah. Like, for space for your best players to operate. Now everybody can shoot. Going back to that, that stretch, and, and certainly some, some, I think by default, you kind of uh, hinted at, like, trying to figure out who you are as a player <clears throat> your rookie year. Do NBA players still watch film? Like, how much film were you watching? How much film do you watch now? Like, when you're, like, obviously you watch film as a team. Yeah. But it's, it's, it got shorter and shorter throughout my career. I don't know how much film Mo's does. But, you know, in terms of your own development as a player, how much are you watching your pick and roll reps or your off ball reps or your cutting reps, whatever it may be? So, what I've gotten away from is watching the last game I played, like the next day or something like that. Cause you get so caught up in the mistake you made there or, in, you like it's hard to kind of figure out a pattern of um, not to kind of make it easier. What do I want to get better at? Um, but I watch I watch other games all the time. Um, I watch a lot of the other players, different stuff. It's not it's not like oh he scored thirty. Um, I gotta watch every bucket. It's like Luca, how does he slow down in the paint? How how does he get to two feet all the time? Shea, how's he changing his pace? Um, like different stuff like that. Jimmy, how's he creating contact? How's he getting to the line 18 times in a game? Like those little things, that's what I try to look at. And then I try to look at my stuff. Um, the second step spectrum, I think, is a great thing where you can like kind of type in everything. And, and I can see how, how do I do it in, in a similar situation? Um, or how, how do I do this stuff? Uh, not yet. You know, how can I improve that? Who put you on second spectrum? We, the team. We, the team did. Yeah. They gave everybody an account? Or they, you, it's a team I, account. I think if you ask, if you ask nicely, I think you, you get one. <laughs> oh, I have an account. No, I have one. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just saying, as a player, <laughs> okay. I'm like, it's not one of those things that you just get. Um, but I, yeah, I got I lo- one. I love. I love that you use that. By the way, it, it really is like if you wanted to do your homework, essentially, because I was the same way when I had a bad game. I did not want to think about it. No, it's just no. And, and you got a game in a day or two. So yeah, you're it's just no like, real I'm benefit. Flushing yeah. it. What I would do is like, if I had a stretch where certain things didn't feel right, then I would say, can you put an edit together yeah. of every right, left footwork or every left, right footwork? Like, I feel like for a month I was shooting really well off the dribble. Now all of a sudden I'm like seven for my last 24. Right. Like, I'm, I'm trying to pick up some things. Maybe yeah. sometimes you just miss, but. I never got caught up in that, and I regret not having a second spectrum. Oh, I mean, it's when amazing. I played. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So, what type of things are you typing in a second spectrum? Like, give me an example. I would say one thing that I'm focusing on this year is getting slower as I'm getting closer to the basket. The decel, um, decelerations, yes. different ways to do it. One thing I talked about, or that we talk about, is uh, you know getting more shots really close to the rim um, and kind of eliminating those like short or long mid-rangers 
And I think part of that is pick and rolls, slowing down sometimes, putting people in jail. Um, or if somebody's still in front of me on the side, finding more contact um, instead of just trying to get around people. Um, yeah, so looking at stuff like that. Tommy asked about, uh, you know, or mentioned you and Paulo, but uh, just in terms of his growth this year, even better than he was uh, as a rookie, what, it, what have you seen from him? Yeah, he's uh, super impressive. Um, I think I think Paolo, he just he creates so much attention. Um, every time he gets the ball, there's like everybody's looking at him. And um, I think Paolo has really figured out how to make other guys better. Um, it's not really about how to make this pass, how to make this shot. It seems like he just he kind of gets all of that pretty quickly. But I've been just super impressed with his maturity and his leadership this year. Um, you know, really being more of a vocal vocal leader than he was last year as a rookie and um, really setting the tone, honestly, in most games with his uh, with his focus, his confidence, his belief going into the game. And I think it just um, yeah, triggers down, you know, down the line for the whole team. It seems like the vibes are good. Yeah. It seems like they're genuine. Are oh, they? Yeah, of course. Yeah, they are. Like, it, like I, when I watch you guys play, like, you know, Cole's out there doing stuff. Jalen's doing stuff. No, we really enjoy Your brothers it. being an asshole. Like it's just Joe. We, gotta, we have, Joe, to, talk, we have Joe to talk about is being no, an no, asshole. We have to talk about Mo, by the way, before and Joe. By the way, I was, I was watching the Heat game the other night. This dude. So Joe scores, and the camera turns to Joe, and Joe is literally jawing at some fan sitting courtside. Yeah, and the Heat dribble the ball up. And Joe's still jawing <laughs> and he's guarding the ball and he's still jawing. And then the guy just goes in and scores on Joe. <laughs> it was like, like the most Joe That's Ingles awesome. play ever. That is awesome. <laughs> no, yeah, we, we got a great group. We really enjoy being around each other. And um, it's cool that, you know, you, you say that you can see that while, while watching us play. I think we do have a great group and a, and a good vibe going. And um, yeah, obviously want to continue to get better and, Still got a lot of steps to take as a group, I think. Is there is there a player leader? Like who's who's the guy that sort of sets the tone for you guys? I would say Joe um brings a lot of experience, uh, obviously uh with and uh way more than everybody else and has been on winning teams. So I think Joe has has talked a lot more than anybody else, I would say. Um but I would say Paolo is uh yeah, he's yeah, I think he's growing into that role pretty naturally. What would you what would you think about Mo if you were he was not your brother and you were playing against him? Um, <laughs> I think I think Mo I think first of all I want to say this: a lot of people just see the the Kieran Hayes fight or he talked shit or something like that on social media. They don't actually watch us play. If you watch us play, really, there's only one thing that you can go away from the game with, and that's that Mo Wagner is playing really hard tonight. Yeah. Yeah, he's, and he's making an impact. And if you guys, if somebody's not really watching the game, then they, then they, they, they shouldn't have a strong opinion on on him. I would say um, Mo's gotten better every year. Um, clawed his way back to a great spot in the league, and like I said, I think he's making an impact every every game. There's uh, there's a lot of players, not a lot. There's a, a select group of players that bring that level of energy every night. And on in that group, within that group, there's a spectrum of those players. We all know who they are of extra. Mm -hmm. And I say uh, Mo is like way down the line. Oh of yeah, extra. Yeah. Like I, I, I think I think I mean Mo's an emotional guy. Like you said, yeah. he brings energy. There is at times it's probably a little too much, um, but I I don't think it's like it's not so much as it seems. I think to most people, yeah. um, I would say that. And um, I think his impact is far more positive than any of those uh, things. And I think he's actively trying not to be in those situations. So, um, I mean, I don't know that I, I live with him and we talk about this kind of stuff. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I th I'm, I'm proud of him all for uh, the development, I would say, that, it, that he's taken. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. You live with Mo? Yeah, we live together. It's your reality show. NBA players, brothers, roommates. Yep. Do you guys ever talk about how silly that sounds? Not, <laughs> not I'm not saying that you live, but like you're growing up in Germany. And oh you're yeah, like, and we talk about that you're like every week. Yeah, teammates in the NBA and roommates. Yeah, it's 
<laughs> yeah, we got we got super lucky. We we're, we're enjoying uh, we're enjoying you know every second that we get together. Yeah, it's amazing. I was gonna ask you about draft night um, real quick. Was were the magic a foregone conclusion? Was there any question going in? Oh no, I had I had like five or six pre draft workouts all in that kind of late lottery range. I would say like five to fourteen. Um, so yeah, I didn't really know. I had a good workout with the Magic. I would say that, but I definitely didn't know where I was going. Yeah. My last question for you is around Jalen Sucks, because I said at the beginning of the year when the Boston Celtics traded for Drew Holiday, I was like, I think the Boston Celtics have the two best on guard, like defensive guards in the NBA. And I've probably watched, I probably watched half of your games this year. And now I'm like, there's a third guy. <laughs> and it's Jalen Suggs. Yeah. His impact, like you guys have, I think, I think they're third right now yeah, in defensive third. rating. His impact, point of attack, has been just spectacular. How, like as his teammate, how does he sort of just get that buy-in every night to be that? Because that's not an easy thing to do. I don't care how athletic or how quick you are to be that every night. How does he do that? How does he get that buy-in for himself? I mean, Jalen is, uh, as they say, a dog. Like, um, <laughs> I think in those moments, like his football, like he was a great football yeah, yeah. player growing up. I think that comes out a little bit. Um, but, I mean, yeah, like you said, he's changing the game out there. Um, putting pressure on the ball handlers. Um, and I think that sets the tone for the whole possession when uh, when he's locked in like that, um, fighting over screens, um, getting deflections, all of that, all of that stuff. I think, um, and I think we created a culture where like that's celebrated in film sessions, that's celebrated on the bench, stuff like that. And um, I think it kind of motivates everybody else a little bit to you know get some of that in yeah. the game. Yeah. No, it was just interesting because when I was asking about the tone setter for the players, yeah, you know, and you said Joe and and Paulo. Like, I think there's, like, the locker room tone setters. I don't know how vocal mm -hmm. Jalen is, but certainly the tone setter on the court. Yeah, we, And I we think talk at times Jalen is that guy. We talk a lot about that. Um, defensively, obviously, that's one of our uh, – or that, that's our main identity right now as a team. He's getting challenged a lot, I would say, by coaches to keep doing that every game and keep setting the tone like he has been. And, uh, I mean, he has, a, he has a tall task every night. Um, and, I mean, he's, he's responded, I would say, uh, yeah, every time so far, yeah. Franz, this has been awesome. Yeah, thank we you, We appreciate guys. you, man. You're welcome back anytime. Appreciate anytime. it. Anytime. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.